Good evening. Great to see everybody. Y'all pray for my little wife. She's home, not feeling great today, but uh, Jenny jumped in, is, did, is doing a great job tonight. But we want to worship the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I know a place where we can go to lay the troubles down in your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make you whiter than and tide in his rising up deep inside a current that moves to make you come alive living water brings the dead to life oh, oh, oh. we're going down to the river down to the river down to the river to pray yeah, yeah. let's get washed by the water washed by the water rise up in a maze into our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming to worship you tonight. Go ahead, Jenny.
so much for worshiping tonight amen thank you kids for singing with us tonight for you old people sit down why don't you walk around shake somebody's hand hug their neck tell them you're nice and cool and it's not hot outside amen tell them it's nice and cool and it ain't hot thank you stubby appreciate you bubba uh no it'll be okay as long as i know it's there i ain't gonna get up there tonight Amen, amen. 
Y'all doing a good job tonight. If you're well, uh, with us online, well, God bless you. I'm glad you're here tonight and uh, watching us on your TV, your tablet, your c computer or whatnot. Like David Letterman called it, watching us out there on the worldwide internet. Amen. Worldwide internet. We're glad you're here. Glad everybody got to be here. I know you're having a tough week. This heat is something else. Something else had a heat index the other day of 120. Amen. And uh, for God help anybody that's working outside. And, um, and I thought, boy, I'm going to I'm gonna have to remember that uh, the next time it's 70 degrees in December. Amen. You know, you got you to gotta pay the fiddler sooner or later. Got to pay the fiddler. Amen. Amen. Brother Lonnie, it's good for the HVAC business, though, isn't it, brother? Amen. They're running can to can't. I got a, a buddy that's got a, a shop there in Kaufman, and uh, he's got uh, my red truck and, uh, with air conditioner problem. And uh, he was running around that morning with the with a Freon tank in one hand and the and the and the hoses in the other, and everybody there looked aggravated and hot. <laughs> he said it's hard to keep people happy this time of year. So hot for this time of year. So be praying, be praying for the farmers and such, um, and and that kind of thing. Uh, as uh, I never prayed so much for rain till I started growing hay, and then all of a sudden it became an important thing. Right? It's always about us, isn't it? Psalms chapter 119 psalms chapter 119 we're going to preach the longest chapter in the bible all in 15 20 minutes tonight so amen i hope it'll be a blessing to you no in reality we're just going to look at verse one tonight and kind of give you an introduction into psalms 119 and for those of you that are maybe hadn't got to be here with us on some wednesday nights and online i know last week we had vacation bible school going on uh, we're kind of looking through the psalms uh, in a sermon series entitled songs for life because regardless of whatever you touch on emotionally uh, in life there's a psalm that's going to meet you right at the point of your need and it is in my opinion one of the books not that we don't need to know all 66 but if I, ha I only had a brief time to live and God was only going to really let me get to know five books of the Bible psalms would be one of those books Genesis and Psalms John Romans and Revelation and you say brother Todd where'd you get that list well it came right out of my head that's just brother Todd's list ain't nothing uh, special or sacred about it Psalms chapter 119 of course is the longest chapter in the Bible 176 verses just about all of the verses talk about one thing and that is the word of the Lord. If you really put a hard pencil on it, I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago and couldn't really remember all of them, but I think it's best really if you really put a hard pencil on it. About five of the 176 verses don't specifically, without kind of having to strain at it a little bit, talk specifically about the word of the Lord. But it's not redundant in, in the least. And it, and it talks about in verse 1 the reality of a blessing that we're going to try to really get into and walk in in the next few weeks as we kind of just look a little bit. We're not going to look at, at every verse in it, uh, but we're going to kind of touch around through Psalms 119. We're going to kind of pull out a few little gems. Um, hopefully that'll be a help uh, to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then let's read verse 1 together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us out in the middle of the week. Thank you, Lord, for the work week going as well as it has and the duties that we have to take care of. Be with our number that are all on the road. For, Lord, we have so many that are vacationing and going about, and we pray for their rest, their relaxation, and their safety. Uh, we thank you for the great week we had last week with VBS. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the joy in those kids. We thank you especially for those that were saved and those that, of their family that are, that are coming to know you. As Lord, we see the, the fruit of those labors come in. We thank you so much, Lord, for showing us so many things that you are doing uh, in us that are so far beyond us. And, um, and we thank you for that. And we just pray that, uh, that your strength uh, goes forth and that you get glory and that people get help. And Lord, we don't be, want to be remembered or anything like that. We seek no reward. We just thank you for saving us. We thank you for the cross, your empty tomb, and the reality, Lord, that you, uh, uh, sweet Holy Spirit, that you live in us, you help us, you strive with us, um, and, you, and you carry us through our griefs. It's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, Amen. Amen. I believe date 
wrote this. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, and the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you and food to support you and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map. It is the pilgrim's staff. It is the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven is open, and the gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is its grand subject. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Our good is the design, and the glory of God is, is its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. I like how he put that. Fill our memory, rule our heart, and guide our feet the way that we go. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth. It is a paradise of glory and a river of pleasure. It is given to you in life, and it's going to be open before you at your judgment, and it'll be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility. It will reward the greatest labor. It will reward the greatest labor and it will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents i can say this now these many years of preaching that one of the greatest rewards god has ever given me is through his grace a capacity to see his word to be able to see it to be able to read it and in my limited abilities be able to comprehend it to the point that i can not only apply it to my life but he's blessed me in a very weak way to be able to communicate it with others. The word of God is the thing I will put any man attest to if he wonders if God is calling him to be saved. I have that question, uh, not saved, to preach. Yeah, amen. And, and, I, and I, I always put this question to him. If you have to wonder if God's calling you, he's probably not. But if you need some wet fleece, let's open the bible together and i will sit down with them with the bible and i won't tell them where i'm going or wherever i'll just ask them where you kind of been reading and when they tell me where they've been reading i'll open it up and i'll spin it around and i'll put my finger on a verse and i'll say tell me about that verse and they'll go what do you mean i said read it and then start telling me about it and when god's put that call that unction to bring it forth there's just a capacity that comes and it comes out of our own style and it comes out of our own personage but there's always a capacity to formulate it and to be able to package it and hand it to somebody again many of the brethren most of the brethren if not all the brethren are better at it than i am but i thank god for uh he has never not rewarded me when i will diligently study his word Psalms, 1, or Psalms 119 verse 1 says this, blessed. Remember, we've run into that word a lot as we preach through Psalms, right? We keep running into this, 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 this idea of really being happy, being happy despite our circumstances or the undefiled in the way. And when you see the word way, especially in the Old Testament, and to the Jew, that meant the, the goings of their life. And so what he said is, 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 blessed are the people who are undefiled. Could we use the word holy? Holy, pure, in the way that they go. Well, how do you walk in that way? Well, he talks about it here, who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, you are familiar on your outline, and hopefully you got an outline. If you didn't get one, raise your hand. I'll get somebody to run you one. Thank God. Glad, glad you got one. 2 Timothy, if you're watching online with your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says all scripture is given by inspiration of god in other words it means it's god breathed it is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be complete it'll mature you it'll complete you it'll enable you to be able to walk undefiled in the way thoroughly equipped for every good word notice that word thoroughly not just equipped, but completely. It'll bring us to a point of maturity so that we can have a, a growing perfection occurring in our life. There are three things you have to have in your life if you are going to live in anything that looks like a state of revival. 
you are going to have to have witness because if you don't pour out, you're going to rot. You have to pour out. God does not bless any of us to hold that blessing within the confines of ourselves. Blessing is for blessing. Amen? You get filled when you ring out. It's one of the paradoxes of the faith. If you get full and you don't pour out, you're just going to stagnate right there where you are. But if you will let God empty you out, then God will pour more in. And until you've been dog-tired for the cause of Jesus, you don't know what it's like to really be filled, okay? Because why would God go about pouring into something that has no, no outlet? If you got it, say, I got it. You have to, if you, I, I'm sorry, my hearing aids, and I'm not teasing. Would y'all say just real loud, amen? Amen, because amen, I don't think the, the fans are on, right? Okay, so anyway, Brother Todd's still kind of getting used to the hearing aid situation. Lot, my mother says lots of luck. Anyway, you've got to have witness, and you've got to have prayer. You, 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 no one grows beyond their prayer life. Amen. All right, y'all know that. You say, Brother Todd, I already know that. It's funny. Prayer's one thing we know so much about and do so little of. The great sin of the American church is prayerlessness. If we, could, if we would get to praying, we, we would be all right. We would see God move, and, um, uh, and it'd be, I start grinning because I, I'm coming to the conclusion that I didn't know how literal God was going to be about this 300 thing you know of just using a few people and it's not the blessing it's the blesser don't wait for god to bring us 12 1500 people and then we'll do all this stuff because he's he's frankly doing it right now and y'all be praying we might be on the hook for something else I, I can't i can't even tell you i told david gilmer the other day i said i'm telling you if the lord pays for this gym and he doesn't use one tithe or offering to do it we're going to all be able to say look here it was the lord's doing amen all we can do is break the picture and call out but it takes it takes the fellowship. Honestly, I look around at the number of people in here on a Wednesday night, and I think of the things that y'all are getting done. Um, I'm going to make a list here before summer, and I'm going to, on one Sunday morning, I'm going to talk about all the things that's just happened and that you're doing in a year. You know, I don't like to look back. I'm kind of a go-ahead kind of person. You know, past blessings are not sufficient for this hour. And, um, uh, but I think it's going to have to be worth just mentioning uh, because it is amazing the things that's happening. And it's all out of prayer, okay? Nothing great ever happens till somebody starts praying. Now, the third thing is, is the word. If you don't have the word in your life, you don't have food. In fact, you don't even know how to pray without the word. You, you don't know where you're going. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. I've seen some crazy, crazy things happen in the name of Jesus in the context of church by people being unscriptural. They may be well-meaning, but they, they are not doing it according to the word. And God does not work his will against his word. Now, I don't mean to be tacky with anybody in here on Wednesday night or whatever, but more of you are more maturing Christians. So you hear what I'm saying. All over the place, Christians come to a point where they know a lot. Okay? They know a lot. And as soon as you know more than this, God help them, biblically illiterate society, amen, it doesn't mean you know much. Right? Right? Because really, frankly, right now you can live a pretty balanced life just being sure if you're a dude or a girl. You're ahead of a big portion of the population. And I don't mean I'm not being ugly. I'm being, that's a fact, okay? And because of that, we tend to rely on what we know or what we've learned. But Jesus said a faithful scribe brings out things both old and new. Old and new. He said you cannot put a piece of, of new skin on an old wine skin. You can't patch it that way, right? Because what happens? It, 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 it shrinks, and the old, it, and it changes it. And what happens, Jesus said, and the tear is made worse. So you have to constantly be bringing in the word. Think of how Brother Jim preaches. Brother Jim will talk about something that I've heard him talk about before I've heard him use the same title. Brother Jim says, y'all sing the same songs over and over. 
How come I can't preach the same sermons over and over? Well, what's the difference? It's what God's putting in it now. Amen? Wednesday night crowd, you hear me. Never get to a point where you go, oh, I know that. Because the Word of God is so simple, a child can understand it, and it's so deep, the greatest minds in human history can't fathom it. It's just the reality of this book. It's different than every other book, okay? So if you got to say, I got it, I got to witness, I got to pray, and I got to be in God's Word. And Psalms 119 talks about walking in the reality of God's Word. Three things about God's Word I want you to kind of, as we get into Psalms 119, to be thinking about, okay? And they're there on your outline. And we're just going to kind of, I'm going to talk about kind of all through the whole psalm a little bit. Not going to really run a full expose on, on verse 1 tonight. We're just kind of overview tonight, and then we'll, then we'll get into it from there, okay? Sorry, my crooked head is still getting used to the, the, new, air, the new microphone. It doesn't fit the knots on my head yet. Number one, the word of the Lord is authoritative. It's good for doctrine, for truth, for reproof, for correction, okay? It is the guide. Um, a fellow named Stephen Cole uh, said this, and it's there on your outline. When God speaks, he doesn't mumble. When God speaks, he doesn't mumble. Your Bible is not a set of helpful hints to help you live a happy life. And that's what American Christianity is turning the Bible into. Oh, a set of little principles that you can kind of follow, and it'll help you kind of live a better life. I mean, the liberals preach from that. They don't, they don't even believe in heaven. They don't believe in hell. But if, if you do what Jesus kind of said, you'll, you'll live a better life than if you didn't. Okay? It's more than that. It's more than that. When God speaks, he speaks in a way where he conveys his will in a way that is authoritative. And, and our human nature rejects authority in our flesh because who, want, who do we want to be the authority? Me, myself, and I. That's, that's who we want to be the authority, right? And so, and so we, we reject against words like the law. We reject against words like the commandments. But you have to remember they're the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. If you got it, say, I got it. In Psalms 119, there are nine Hebrew words that are, that, are, that are in one way or another connected directly to, let's just say, the Word of God or a word from God. You see all of them by the time you get to verse 11. By the time you get to verse 11, the first seven verses of Psalms 119 introduce a new word, Psalms 8, verse 8, 119, verse 8, uses one of the other words from before. Then verse 9 gives us another word. Verse 10 uses one already from the list, and verse 11 gives us another one. I want to give you those so that as you study with us through this time, the next few weeks, as we look at Psalms 119, you'll have a good grasp on what's going on. So, number one on your outline, if you got it, say, I got it. In verse 1, it is the word law who walk in the law of the Lord. That is God's will for how we live. The law of God is given so that we comprehend what God's will is so that we may apply it to our life so that we can walk in his will. How do we know what God's will is? How do we know God is good? He told us he was. What, oh, I think this or that is, 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 what? What's the word I'm thinking about? What's the word? Todd, come on, man. Irrelevant. What you and I think about God, well, I think God's this. I feel like God's that. That's all ludicrous. We, we, we can't turn one hair on our head a different color. We can't add one inch to our own body. And when God decides we're through breathing, then baby, we're through breathing. But yet, what we feel about God is we become God and we define who God is. But everything we know about God, God's told us in his word and his will. One of the reasons the devil don't want you believe in the word, one of the reasons the world don't want you following the word is because when you follow the word, you know what you're doing. He created them in the word, male and female. 
Now, we've come up with 20 different genders. And as ridiculous as it all sounds, people are running around it believing it. Why? Because they will not accept what God has said in his word. Nowhere in human history has gender and, and the sex of a being and the gender of a being been two different things. Never. It's ludicrous. But the world says, no, it's not. Brother Todd, you just don't understand. Well, I do understand what God has said. And he created them male and female. And I'll go with the Lord, and the Word of God says, let the Word of God be true and every man a liar. Just if you'll go with the Lord, you'll end up knowing what God's will is, and you won't be led by your feelings. You have to be led by facts. The facts of Scripture will take you over the mountain, right, Brother David? He'll, it'll, it'll, fuel the, it'll fuel the engine, and it'll take you over the mountain. You live by your feelings. They're going to flip. They're going to flop. You're going to be double-minded in all your ways. You ain't going to be the little engine that could. You're going to be the little engine that tried to get up the hill and then just kind of got stuck by the time you're 40 you need counseling because you're so stuck in life if you got to say i got it number two in verse two we see the word testimonies you'll see god's word called you it, it called a testimony a lot of times when you see the word testimonies used or a testimony used you see it with the idea of a warning a lot of times it will come in the in the uh, it with, can I use the word nuance? nuance? Nuance sounds makes you sound so smart, doesn't it? You know, Gary, that's one of your words. You throw that around a lot, that word nuance, right? Miss, Mimi th thought I misspelled it. Where did I put, where did I use nuance at? Oh, look at there. Well, look how fancy I am. <laughs> Make you want to talk like a Frenchman. But anyway with the idea of a warning number three in verse three you see the word called the ways or the way of god you'll see it either way it's the same hebrew word we put an s on it just however we're kind of flowing it in a sentence and whenever you see god most of the time talk about his ways he compares them to our ways a lot of times when you see something about the way of god you notice a contrast or a comparison to our ways and what do you find his way is better than our way. Okay, you'll see it all through, through life, in the word and in practice. Verse four and number four, you see the word precepts. God gives us precepts. Precepts are particular instructions. Particular instructions for doing a certain thing. Maybe have to do with worship, may have to do with prayer or something like that. But uh, maybe in the giving of the law and the sacrificial system, you see it in the New Testament about... We are given particular instructions. We are told particularly to give. We are told particularly how to give. We give in tithes. We give in offerings. We bring it to the storehouse. We don't pick and choose. We send it to wherever we're members at. That's where we send our, our tithe to. We don't put a bunch of strings on it. We don't make sure the pastor don't use it in places we don't want. And so, you know what I'm saying? We just we give it a particular way. Now, you can do that with an offering all you want, but don't designate your tithes. Designating your tithes is a way to usurp authority in the church. It just is. Well, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't give uh, tithes, Brother Todd, but uh, but uh, but we'll uh, we'll buy the heating. I was messing with Lonnie while I go about heating and air conditioning. So we'll buy the air conditioner and we'll buy this and we'll buy that. Oh, you're going to tell the church what we need. Yeah, I tell you what, I will do. I'll put the church parking lot in. Well, maybe the church don't want a parking lot. Well, I'll buy the church some, a, a, an organ. You know how many people are mad at Brother Todd in Kaufman County because I refuse to take their organ? Because they got an organ that they wanted their kid to learn to play, and they never did, and they're tired of it junking up their house. So, well, let's, let's just carry it to the church. Call the church. Hey, Brother Todd, we're going to give you all a blessing. That always makes me nervous. Hey, Brother Todd, I'm going to give you a blessing. I had one guy tell me, you're going to get to do my, my wedding this Saturday. I said, well, brother, I'm going to miss that blessing because that's my anniversary and I'm going to be out with my wife. <laughs> Sorry, I don't even know you. But anyway, even if I did, I ain't skipping out on my wife for you. You're going to get another anniversary. I had May 24th before you did. But anyway, the, you see what I'm saying? Well, if the church has a need, we'll, we'll meet that need. Oh, so you just hold it back until you find something you think's a worthy cause. 
don't ever do that. If you do that, stop that. Now, you do that with your, with your designated offerings all you want. That's fine. God give you a heart for certain missionary or something like that. That's fine. But you do have to learn with your giving to give it to the Lord, and you let it go completely. And you have to realize everything I ever did in church, I did for Jesus. I have people ask me this or that about when I was in Colton, Brother Todd, this, Brother Todd. Everything I did, I did for Jesus. God don't owe me a thing. Amen? He gives particular instructions. And I would just encourage you to follow the instructions. And I would encourage you to read the instructions. Brethren, I want you to raise your hand before... No, no, because that would be a vow. But hey, let's raise your hand and say, I will try to read the instructions. Put your hand up, all the men. Me, ladies, you don't have to. Y'all read the instructions. Men, hold your hand up. I will try to read the instructions. I got an uncle. He's an instruction reader, right? We're out one Christmas putting together a trampoline. Uncle James is like, hey, let's read the instructions. I'm like, hey, it's just a bunch of springs and a mat. Let's put it on. It's freezing out here, right? How, how dumb can it be? We got 20 people. Grab some springs, put it on. Well, Gary, we didn't do it by the instructions, and so the mat was a little off to one side. It wasn't off very much, so what do I do? I weigh 270 pounds at the time. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll jump up and down on it, and that'll square it up as the springs back bounce around never do that because what is going to next what's going to happen next is something called shrapnel in the form of springs and every spring that was pulled too tight when i jumped one time we lost eight of them and killed santa claus all in one night i mean it was horrible we had to pull it all off find some more springs what we do read the instructions 12 and 6 3 and 9 right these and th and guess what gary it works Read the instructions. So much of life can, can be lived so much more skillfully, and could I use the word easily, by just discovering what the Lord has given in the form of a precept and just believing him enough to do it his way. All right. Number five, and in verse five, you see the word statutes. And when the word of God uses the form of statutes it's talking typically about the binding force and or the perseverance and or the perseverance hey chris would you get me a, a water brother i'm about to start coughing thank you bubba it talks about the binding force and the perseverance of the word in other words it'll last the word of god will last number six and verse six you see the word commandments which simply means god is giving orders God is giving orders. God is giving dictates. He's not giving suggestions. Sometimes he lets you walk to a, to a fork in the road. And he lets you pick whichever way you want to go. But there are some things God has just laid down and said, these things you shall do and these things you shall not do. Number seven, you're going to have to write small because I decided to add this other word for you. Judgments slash ordinances. Yeah, you're going to have to write little. I didn't give you a very big blank. Judgments and or ordinances. Whenever you see those words in your English language, and in particular in your English Bible, in particular here in Psalm 119, it is the same Hebrew word. It's just how the translator decided to translate it. Does that make sense? Amen? You got me? So it's the same Hebrew word. That talks about the justice rooted in God's character. Okay? Uh, the judgments of God are like a wise judge considering the human situation. And he's making ruling on what's right, what's wrong, and how he's going to go about dealing with it. When you, when you read the book of Revelation, you see the angels and you see the people in heaven singing and talking about God, how, how just you've been in your judgments. How just you've been in what you've done. Thank you, Bubba. Ooh, that's a nice little one. That's handy. Chris fancy. Tanya made him fancy. He, he married so far over his head, he couldn't help it. He, 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 he got fancy. Now, she's classy, but you, we just call you fancy, all right? Isn't it funny how the Lord elevated man? How a wife elevated man? Amen? 
Now, what she did wrong to, for God to put this judgment of creation, we'll, we'll talk about that another day. Number eight and verse nine is the word, word, W-O-R-D. And this is going to look a little confusing. Let's just go ahead and fill in number nine there in verse 11, and the same thing is there, word. The best way to translate the Hebrew word for number eight there in verse nine and in verse 11 is to use the word, word but it's two different Hebrew words. Does that make sense? There's two different Hebrew words that are translated here, word, okay? Expression of thought, okay? Verse nine, it just specific, specifically means God has spoken. In verse 11, you'll see it a lot of times God has spoken with the, new, with the nuance of a promise, Okay, and they're just two different Hebrew words, and I could say them, but none of us would know what they are unless we speak Hebrew, okay? But there's two different words, and most often they are translated simply by the word, word. If you got that, say, I got it. Those are the nine forms, names, titles to the word of God that you will see in psalms 119 and within the word so as you read it i just i just scan down here i see verse 15 i will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways so here he talks about the word in two different words he talks about the ways right as compared to our ways and he talks about precepts so lord i'm going to consider your particular instructions about how to live and i'm going to especially consider that in light of the way your way is better than our way does that make sense okay so i'm going to meditate on it i'm going to study lord on the specific things you've told me to do i'm not just going to know the things that you told me to do but i'm going to study on the things you told me to do and how to do them okay that's just me glancing at verse 15 right verse 19 i am a stranger in the earth hide not thy commandments from me lord i don't know what i'm doing on this planet i need direction and you're a good god and you're a great guide and you are authoritative and you're perfect so if you said it it's going to be right lord i'm down here on the earth i don't have a clue what i'm doing amen Amen, we're a bunch of fence turtles, right? I don't know what we're doing. You ever see a turtle sitting up on a fence post? There's certain things you know. He didn't get there by himself. Amen? Amen? He has no clue what he's doing up there. Amen? And he got no idea how to get down. Amen? I say that about our presidents of the United States a lot. Fence turtle. Somebody stuck him up there, and that's who's really in charge. Amen. The rest of them are just there to get their face lifts and get their teeth, teeth bleached. And uh, I, I'd just like us to vote in one president that had stained teeth. <laughs> Have y'all noticed? I mean, one more facelift, one more uh, gastric bypass. <laughs> Poor old Chris Christie going to blow away. I mean, that's a heavy brother. What's he doing? Skinny. But anyway, I digress. I mean, you put a set of aviators on Joe Biden. I seen a picture of him back in 1982. That brother looks a lot better now than he did in 1982. All them hair plugs, they working for him, James. Number two, Roman numeral two. <laughs> Y'all holler at me, move on. Right. The word of the Lord is reliable. Now, I'm not, I didn't, you notice on the outline, I didn't put a lot of proof points here because I'm going to tell you something about the word and its reliability number one it's accuracy and number two it's consistency it's accurate and it's consistent you are going to have to believe the word of God or you're not I think most of y'all in here have heard me talk consistently enough about the reliability the accuracy the consistency uh, the promises made and the promises kept uh, where the word of God lines up in history to where you are, have come to the conclusion or not, I can trust God's word or not. This is why when our children go to university and places like this, it's one of the first things they attack. Oh, you can't trust it. It's just a bunch of books, conglomeration of people. It contradicts itself. And it's a, I always, when somebody goes, it contradicts itself, I, I just ask them where. 
In fact, in one of the one or two places where I know there's a scribal error, it actually even helps facilitate my faith on how things are translated to us. Because once those scribes, even though they knew that the difference in a king between Chronicles and Kings, it says eight and one and 18 in the other, they knew something had happened, but they never would change it. They knew he probably was 18, but anyway. So, but, but, but that's, not, that has, that's not the Bible being inconsistent. That's not the Bible contradicting itself in, in truths. Okay, And when you understand that the Bible is 66 books long written by so many different authors over a period of, you know, Job lived in the time of Abraham, so that's about 2,000 years before Jesus was born, all the way up to about 100 years after Jesus was born, all that time in there, different people, different educational backgrounds, different situations going on politically, all of those kinds of things, and you see how it's written and you see how it flows. I'm, I'm telling you guys, it flows like a river, and, 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 and it proves one point, that Jesus is God, he was coming into the world, World to save mankind who could not save himself he did it on the cross he rose from the grave and defeated our greatest enemy he's got promises left to keep he's going to keep them he's going to come back he is the absolute ruler and reigner of everything and one day when there is no more universe because we don't need it he'll be the king of all of it and time is no more and time space and matter god is done with them It'll, it'll be the way he says. He always keeps his word. It's accurate. Now, your Bible's not a science book. But when he talks about science, it'll be accurate. When he was talking about things moving on a curve and, 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 and those kind of things in Isaiah, and when everybody was thinking the world was flat and all the people who had all the initials behind their names were thinking one thing, God's saying another thing. When it talks about kind after kind, guys, that's still how that's still how creation's happening. I'm sorry. You say, but Brother Todd, uh, you know, you put these birds on this island, they're cracking these rocks, their beaks get bigger. Hey, okay. Okay, that's called microevolution. I got no problem in that. That's obvious. Any idiot can see that. But it but it but that thing don't hit on that rock until it turns into something else. That bird don't hit on that rock till it turns into a dinosaur. It don't hit on that rock till it turns into a dog. It's kind after kind. And it's, that's there's no evidence whatsoever in the record of macro evolution. You look at evolution now and you say, Well, why don't I see it? Well, it's happening so slowly. You look back in the fossil record, you go, Why don't we see it? Well, it happened so quickly. I mean, come on, which is it? Which is it? I seen a little old picture the other day of dinosaur. They had feathers all over it. A little raptor. They had feathers all over it because they got to get these kids to think them dinosaurs turned into birds. Right? I mean, it's just a got to thing, and now it's very subtle, and it's just there. And it's kind of the way they're wanting your kids to be, gra be drag queens. It's very subtle. They're, they just want to send the drag queens in to do a little story time. It's not nothing, not nothing harmful. They think it's the best way to, to educate children. The uh, Speaker of the House said drag is America. I mean, they're the experts. I'm just a hick from Rosser. <laughs> See, that's me not being political. It's accurate. It's consistent. God's word speaks to the human condition. It speaks to the human condition in every age. Oh, you can't, the Bible is it's too simple. These times are too sophisticated. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And while people's knowledge increases, oh, by the way, just the same way God said it would in the last days, that men would run to and fro and their knowledge would increase. And if we ain't a to and fro running people, I don't know who he is. I walked by, I walked out of, La Padera the other day I was sitting there with Misty I said we're going to, have to do something I said we're going to have to we're going to have to increase what we're doing on the web doing some things change this and that I said we're going to have to have some help I was sitting there scratching my head trying to figure it out I said because even though I don't like it we have to deal with it every, every other person on this restaurant is on a cell phone we got, just have to deal with it I got up I started counting them I'm saying these two people got one I don't know who these people are I'm like these two people got one there's one he doesn't have one on there's two there's, there's three and I just walk out and so say, see, Misty, all but two people are on their cell phone. You know what everybody did? Put their cell phone up. They felt guilty about it. We all, we all got a cell phone. We all know something about it. We don't know what we're doing with it. This guy's sitting there 
with his beautiful wife, but he's looking to see what Sean Hannity thinks on Fox News. I've seen it. I mean, come on, brother. I mean, Hannity's got nice hair and all, but your wife's got him beat. Can you imagine what Alexander the Great would have done with an Iron Dome defense system? Do you think it would have took Hannibal as long as it's taken the Russians to take out Ukraine? Give him a smartphone? Huh? Ain't no, he been dropping them elephants out the sky on them Romans today. Gary? Running to and fro? Know so much, we know so little, we think we're so complex. We're not complex. The same way we always had. Greedy? Selfish, narcissistic, covetous, lying, cheating. Can't be happy with anything we got. Got to have somebody else's wife, somebody else's car, somebody else's truck. People the same. People been causing drama. You ain't, did you read Genesis? That's a soap opera, people. Can you not see Potiphar's wife? And days of our life being, I mean, it's right there. Now, some of you young people say, huh? So these old people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> As sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our life. Now, we wasn't, we wasn't uh, days of our life people. Me, me, me and you was all my children people. <laughs> Amen. All my children, lunchtime, every day in the summertime. Anyway, anyway. Hey, that was my first thing I gave up, my man card. I still haven't ever driven a minivan but I did enjoy soap operas. <laughs> so anyway, but it's consistent, and it speaks into our condition right now. I'm telling you what's still the best way to raise kids, still the best way to live a marriage, still the best way to follow the Lord, still the best way to run your business. You recognize, don't you, that every successful business on this planet runs off the principles of Scripture. You know that, right? I was at a TASB convention, Texas Association of School Board Members convention one time, and they were talking about strategic planning, and I was sitting in there, and I was talking to them, and I'm just sitting there noticing that a whole lot of this stuff looks plagiarized from Solomon. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, there's some Bible here, right? So, uh, so they get done this long spiel, and it's a good little deal, and I get up, and I walk up to the guys that develop this strategic planning model that they're selling to these uh, intellectuals and uh, know-it-alls and the people they tell us we have to listen to. It's like Bill Gates, all of a sudden, I have to listen to what he thinks about COVID-19. I thought he was just rich. When did he become a doctor in microbiology? Like, but if you're rich enough, I guess somebody will listen to you. But anyway, so we're sitting there, and the thing gets done. I walk up there. I'm asking guys questions. A lot of us is very in tune. And I said, uh, fellas, I said, uh, how much of this y'all get from the Bible? I don't know if they're saved or lost. One guy looks at me and goes, all of it. And I said, I'll right, break it down. He goes, I used to pastor this church. I was a youth minister for 20 years. We got to notice in this stuff, this stuff works across the board. Everything's done in faith. Everything's done in faith. And they just, they went to talking about it and this and that. And they go, man, we box this stuff up. We sell it. We put a lot of uh, flashy stuff on the computer screen. He said, these superintendents buy it up like it's the newest thing. I said, ain't that something? If they knew their Bibles, they know they already have this, they already have this program down there at the school. It's consistent. When you're in doubt, follow the word. If you got it, say, I got it. 755, let's move on. The word of the Lord is authoritative, it's reliable, and it's powerful. And it's powerful. Number one, it saves. Let me just give you a, let me just give them all to you. I'm going to fill them all in and we'll talk about them all at once. It saves. Did y'all put that? Yeah. Would you just write up there, cause me to live? Most of the time, when the word that literally means cause me to live is used in verses 25, 37, 50, 88, 93, 107, 144, 149, 154, 156, and 159, it, it talks about revive me. But it literally means cause me to live. 
Not all the time it's translated revived. Sometimes it's in the context of coming into the kingdom. We come to life in Christ and we live our life in Christ. You understand that when you got saved, you stepped into a perpetual action. God is always saving you. He will always be saving you from now on. Okay, does that make sense? Amen? Amen. Okay, okay. And so the word, and you see there, I, I just put down the places I could find in Scripture, uh, in, in Psalms 119 where it talks about it. It saves us, number two, it sustains us. Verse 50, verse 57, verses 61 through 64, 75, 76, 92, 165. And if you will read Psalms 119 closely, you will see that where he talks about sustaining us, it sustains us in a lot of trouble. The writer talks about a lot of trouble. Now, either I think David or Ezra wrote the 119th Psalm. I don't know who. We don't know who wrote it. But in either case, it was somebody that was acquainted with troubles. I was reading some on this in Psalms 119. I came across a quote from a German uh, theologian who's in heaven now, Thickle, uh, Hubert Thickle. He... Uh, he came to the United States and, and toured a bunch of churches, talked with a bunch of church leaders, and asked him what did they thought of the American church when he got back to Germany. And he said, American Christians have an inadequate view of suffering. Now, this is a guy that came through the horrors of World War II. He said, American Christians have an inadequate view of suffering. Most of the time when we suffer, we go through a myriad of negative emotions and put at the point that we can't do anything else when our anger, our rage, our depression, our sorrow does not sustain us, then we'll turn to God in the suffering because, frankly, we couldn't find anything else that would work you'll find that the writer of Psalms 119 went to the Lord quickly with his problems. You're going to have problems. I don't like the problems of this world. I don't like the heartache of this world. I've spent a lot of hours this week praying in some situations that are hurting and hurtful and grievous. My spirit asks God all the time, Lord, how long? But it is a reality if we are going to walk with Christ and we're going to try to live righteously in this world, we are going to suffer difficulties. And the Lord's bigger than our difficulties. It sustains us. Number three, it shows. By shows, I mean it guides us. It shows us the way. Word is powerful. It shows us where to go. Psalms 18, 24, Psalms 119. Y'all know what I'm saying. Verse 18, verse 24, 98 through 101, 104, 105, 130. You can take this home and, and study through where one of the wonderful things about the Lord's word is it guides us. Psalms 105, you want to circle it, is probably one of the most well-known verses in all of 119. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How will a young man, he says, keep his way? Well, by walking according to and discovering what is in the Word. You will find that the more of the Bible you know, the fewer mistakes you make, the fewer bad choices you make, and the way of the Lord is considerably more obvious. The more of the Word you know, you will be able to differentiate between things your flesh might want to do and the things that are absolutely contrary to what the will of God would be, and you quit making dumb mistakes, i.e., your retirement plan is not the lottery. You don't need another wife. Your children can't satisfy you. Children are good. Money can't satisfy you. Money's good. Money's not bad. We use money to keep the lights on. We use money to broadcast this out onto the internet. Money's not bad. Amen? 
But making mistakes with money can be real easy. But I'll tell you what, if you know enough of the Word of God, you will not do a lot of foolish things. Nobody walking in the Word of God pulled a three-day bender this week. You will not be drunk for a month if you'll follow the way of the Lord. You, you won't live in the destructive things that come out of that. Had a guy tell me one time he got right with Jesus, he's trying to do good. I don't want to give him a lot of specifics here, but he had done things against members of his family. He did not understand why when the Word of God says that they should forgive him, that he was having problems with them trusting him. He says he does not remember, because he was so drunk, doing the things that he did. But one of them told me that he violently attacked him with a weapon. And, and the guy said, well, I didn't do that. I said, hold on a minute. I thought you couldn't remember. Well, I came. So then you don't know what you did. That situation to this day, many years later, is unresolved. And it has caused nothing but sorrow and heartache. It was an easy situation to avoid. Be ye not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Are you following me? Life gets considerably simpler when you know the way. When you got a compass. When it doesn't matter how dark the woods are, if I can get my light and we're trying to go north, and I go, hey, we go this way. How do you know? Needles pointing that way. We want to go north. Here is a good guide. It's saying here, and all the other directions and all the other pitfalls, you never experience them. You give me a man and a woman, husband and a wife, a set of kids surrendered to God's word, everything gets easier. And for those of you who've got kids, let me tell you, get them to, to come to a point and do everything you can. Now, one, you got to preach it, and two, you got to try to live it so that you look consistent, okay? But when you do that and your kids come to a point where they recognize the authority of God's word, they'll surrender to it even when they don't want to do what you say. I'm going to tell you something. Raising Mason and Margie, two people, two believers, who they came to the Lord young, praise God, and they, and they tried to, you know, I mean, none of us are perfect. None of us in the PV house have ever been. But we try to follow the word of God. It's amazing how when a teenager is wanting to do thus and so, and, and you go, well, the word says. Well, you're right. Because even when they are despising what you're doing, they're surrendered to the word, and it what? It makes sense. It makes sense. Best thing you'll ever do. Try your best to live the word. You're not going to do it perfectly. God knows I didn't. But both of my kids, the highest compliment they, they give me in my life is that the man you see at the church is the guy I grew up with. But all that is, is trying to live scripturally. And if you got teenagers, you need to know the Proverbs. Y'all need to read the Proverbs. You need to get a monthly book report done by your children on the Proverbs. <laughs> all right? Because I'm telling you, man, that is the best way. Mason, you know how, Gary, I don't know if you noticed this, brave, but... I'm going to just guess something. That the things ab about Nick that got on your nerves the most are the things that you perceive as weaknesses in yourself. That's why you always butt head with the one that's most like you. That's what it is. It's what's going on in me. 
Now, left to my own devices, I can be rather... Could we just lay down and sleep a little bit? Could we just, be, could we just sit on a shade tree? How about a snack, right? So Mason would want to sleep late. You know, he, now he, I'm talking about a 15-year-old kid, right? 14-year-old kid. Boy, we got to get up. We got to work before we play. You know, all that stuff I learned growing up. Got to work before we play. It's time to get up. You can't, you can't, you can't run with the big dogs uh, at, at, at night. Uh, if you can't run with the big dogs in the morning, you can't go out with them at night and all that kind of stuff. Amen? And... Uh, I'd say, boy, get up. Uh, you know, they do that like they're a zombie coming back to life. Uh, and, you know, and all that. And I would just start quoting, go to the ant, thou sluggard. And I can, I can go walk into that youth building right now and holler, go to the ant. And he'll quote the whole verse to me. But here's the thing. He, he himself, even as a teenager, a perfect kid, but he recognized the authority of God's word and realized it was bigger and big enough for him. And I'm telling you, it helps. Just to be able to say, is that what God's word would say? Do you think that's what, I mean, for real, do you think that's what Jesus would have us do in this situation? Because I'm telling you, the only thing that controls my temper is the word of God. And the older I get, I thought it'd get easier. Eh, wrong. Wrong. Now I've got that old man non-filter starting to hit me, right? I don't care. I'm walking through the, I'm walking through the Denny's going, or the Lapa there going, he's got a phone, he got a phone, he's ignoring his wife. Look at this guy. He got a tackle box on his face. I mean, you know, is that, 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 that. I'm that guy. I'm going, you know, I have to fight it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They got all that ornaments in their face, look like it fell in a tackle box. And, 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 hey, and that ain't mean because anybody puts more than 20 things in their faces wanting somebody to acknowledge them. All right, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's like the girls that come to the gym and they got on lingerie for workout clothes and then they're posting on TikTok how all these perverts in the gym are looking at them. I'm sorry, ma'am. You... <laughs> Whew, caught that one. Caught that one. You're going to look like you used to work on Harry Hines Boulevard in the gym. You're going to have somebody look at you. Let's just leave it at that. Hopefully, the red light district ain't what it used to be up there. Number three, don't ask me how I know about it. I was up there ministering to people. Number four, it sanctifies. It, it, It sets us apart and enables us to live holy lives. Verse 9, 11, 36, 37, 133. I want y'all all to look at me on the internet put that camera on right there guys on the internet and in here there is nothing wrong with living a pure life there's nothing unmanly about it there's nothing unbecoming about it holiness without holiness no man will see god holiness is where we strive for did not jesus respond perfectly in every situation i want to be like jesus There is nothing wrong with living a set-apart. That's what sanctified means. You are consecrated, set-apart, set-apart for holy service. And the Word of God will help you walk in holiness. And I'm going to tell you something about walking in holiness. I want all y'all to look at me. If you'll walk in holiness, you will not cause harm. You will not cause harm to your children. You will not cause harm to your spouse. You will not cause harm to your community. I'm going up to the appraisal district tomorrow, no, Friday, to tell them that they allowed a crackhead to set the appraisal price of my house. That he broke in, high as a kite, right, and just, whoo, wished I could sell that house for what they got it appraised for. When I walk out of there, I'm going to conduct myself in a way to where everybody knows in there that I am more concerned with living a holy life than I am with getting my taxes lowered. I got a horse to sell. I'm more, my mama laughs at me, says Todd will undercut his own self 
because I will not do somebody wrong in a deal because it's just a horse. It's just a truck. It's just a brush hog. It's just a pile of fencing. Are you following me? I still have people walk up to me. I was selling this horse one day. Somebody asked somebody, was at auction? And I told them, I said, look, guys, I rode in here with my integrity, and I'm going to ride out that door with my integrity. And 20 years later, I have guys walk up to me and tell me that. I have walked up to guys, and I can walk into a horse sale and say something, and, and to this day, a whole set of absolute heathens will say, Brother Todd said it, it's that way. Now, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just saying are y'all following me? If you're more concerned with being godly and more concerned with somebody coming into the kingdom, you can conduct yourself in a way to where you are a blessing. I want my wife built up. I do not want my wife torn down. Am I so weak-minded that the only way I can feel good about myself is for her to feel bad about herself? Guys, that's where serial killers come from. That's psychopathic. You get worried about living a holy life, you won't be a drama queen. You won't live in a constant state of drama. Because sin avoids holiness, or holiness avoids sin. The two don't live together. And I remember who said it first. Maybe it was Moody. They said the word of God will run sin out of your life, or sin will run the word of God out of your life. It, show, it, it, it sanctifies, and number five, it shifts us. It's not, the, not the Bible doesn't shift around. It's consistent. But we change gears. We go a different direction. Maybe I should have just used the word changes. I like had the S thing going, so I couldn't quit. I'm kind of psychopathic about that. But anyway, verse 14, 16, 24, 77, 92, 111, 129, 162, all talk about how God's word affects us for the better. And we have to stay in it, stay in it, stay in it. I'm going to say this. I'm going to quote Moody here. On the bottom of your outline, the only way you keep a broken vessel full is to keep the faucet on. Ain't that a great way of putting something? That man couldn't barely read or write. He had more power. There's much power. It seemed like the Apostle Paul. Ain't that something? The only way you keep a broken vessel full is you got to keep it under the faucet. Amen? You got to make sure more's going in than what's going out. You ever noticed on your bathtub, your sink, you got that little hole up there at the top? Right? Because most time, if you, if you get a little clogged, you, you can put more water in and you can run out fast enough and it'll come up there and go out to overflow. Guys, we're all broken. Our flesh isn't glorified yet. But if you'll stay in the Word of God, it'll fill you to the point that you got an overflow. Not just what's leaking out our cracks because we all got them. Is that making sense? But it'll run out the overflow. Do you know what being filled with the Spirit, biblically, the definition of that, do you know what that means? It has twofold meaning. One, it means controlled, right? Be you not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, right? Alcohol controls a drunk's brain, amen? So don't, don't do that, that's bad, but rather let the Holy Spirit control you. The other way is it, it flows out. People would see Peter in them, and the first thing they knew is they were filled with the Spirit. People saw Stephen talking, they knew he was filled with the Spirit. What's, what am I talking? It's an overflow. How do you keep a broken vessel in overflow? Because all of us live in a sinful world and all of us deal with the devil and all of us are dealing with a flesh that's not been glorified yet. All of us are dealing with a flesh that gets sick. It's easier to live spiritual when you feel good. Amen, Jay Cecil? I mean, brother, with everything you've been through, you know, physically it just hammers on you. So, so what do you do? You can't, you can't just live off the amount of the Bible you have because you've got plenty of it. But I need more, not less. 
When you're in drama, when you're in difficulty, when there is a health issue, when there is grief, it's more, not less. When the strain is on, it's more, not less. Don't coast. Because if you shut off the tap, it's going to leak out. And you don't know what a day is going to bring forth. I told Chip when he walked in the door today, I said, boy, it's good to see you. I'm glad y'all back. I'm glad that's behind you. If you don't know the story, and most of y'all do, the trial was all the past two, three weeks. They were down there in Seguin and all that stuff. And praise God, it looks like some measure of justice is given. If you don't know your own line, that brother right there in that green shirt, if you see him on that camera, lost his daughter, his firstborn, and their oldest girl and son-in-law to a neighbor murdered them. When that phone rang about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, Chipster, me and you better been full. Because when we walked in that, 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 that uh, sheriff's office to get them two grandkids, yours and brother, no man could have done better than you did that day. I'll say it right here in front of God and everybody. Y'all ought to have seen that brother walking. I mean, there was, some, there was something God was putting in him, only God put in you. And pick up his grandkids and go out to that house a few days before Christmas, start grabbing Christmas presents, and try to get them kids back home and give them some kind of stability when their whole world's been turned upside down. That phone rang that night, and, there, and Danita's telling me what's going on, crying her eyes out. I can barely understand the words she's saying. I'm going to tell you something. Danita Willis didn't need Pastor Todd to run to the spout. Jim Edwards will tell you, get up in the morning, have my prayer, did my walk, go in, sit down. Christian walks in the room. Mama won't wake up, and she got a nosebleed. And Brother Jim's 28-year-old daughter, Tiffany, had died with a brain aneurysm in her sleep. And it was her five-year-old grandson that was living with them that they have since raised, and he's married now and in business, praise God. And Brother Jim will tell you, when you have to go to your knees with your wife at the side of your dead daughter and say, the Lord is given and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord and mean everything you say. Are you following me? We take this for granted. Most American Christians got these Bibles all over the house. We keep open Bibles all over the house. But they don't ward off the evil spirits. They're not charms. They're not lucky charms. I keep the Bibles open to remind me that a closed Bible has no power. But it can lay there open till Jesus comes back and it not have any power. I got to be in it. I have found I know less about it now than when I started. That God amazes me with stuff every day. Guys, glancing at this while ago, verse 19, y'all going to hear a sermon on that. I just touched on it. But God gave me something there in verse 19 when I looked at it. I'd never seen it. It's so full. It's so rich. I know a man that knows some people that when the Iron Curtain was over Russia had two pages from the book of James two pages and they were some of the strongest Christians I have ever seen met or listened to but they said all we had was the word of God we had a front and a back page chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of James and God sustained them and built them and filled them with it Peter said, I'm not going to leave the Word of God to wait tables. But I'm going to study and I'm going to pray. I'm telling you, and I don't mean this to be funny in any way, 
but just by my flesh apart from Christ. I'd be crazy if it wasn't for the Bible. And I'm not saying it to be funny. I'd be crazy. I'd be absolutely bereft of my brains right now if it wasn't for the Bible. Best thing anybody's ever give me is a Bible. Best thing I ever give anybody that I could put in their hands is a Bible. Let's pray. Every child of God in this room and every child of God watching me online right now, ask God to give you a burning heart for his word. If he doesn't give you a burning heart for it, you won't have it. If you're not trying to read your Bible every day, start with a verse. Get up earlier tomorrow morning. Set your alarm a little earlier. Read a verse. Read a chapter. Find that it is not a lamp and a light. This Bible is the way to salvation. God has laid out his gift of salvation that he wants to give to every man, woman, boy, and girl. They hear his call. If you're in this room and God's calling you, this Bible is a love letter to you. It tells you you can't, but he can. You can't, but he wants to. He's able to save you, and he wants to save you. And it talks about every way and everything he did to do it. His promises are there, and his way is sure, and his words can be trusted. If you're online and God's calling you to be saved, ask the Lord to save you tonight. Just pray, talk to the Lord, ask him to save you, and then give us a call, shoot us a text. Send us an email. If you're in this room, you've never asked the Lord to be your Savior, but you'd like to, and you'd like me to have somebody talk to you after service tonight, would you just raise your hand? Brother Todd, it's time. God's been calling me. I need to be saved. Just raise your hand high. Dear Lord, dismiss us in your fear and in your favor. Help us to grow in your word. Help us to know more Bible. We come in here Sunday, and we know now. It's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Y'all get out of here. Have a good night. Stay cool. If y'all know any old people that have bad air conditioners, anything like that or something, make sure the church knows about it.